This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. What does China want? It's a question posed by many in the West, including politicians, scholars, journalists, and members of the general public. Some assert China wants to topple the current international order and dominate the world. Others say China wants to be the only superpower. Where do these ideas come from? Does China have a secret plan for the future of mankind? And what really does China want? Welcome to the Global Thinkers Special, jointly brought to you by CGTN and the Institute for Global Cooperation and Understanding at Peking University. From Beijing, I'm Li Xin. I'm pleased to be joined in alphabetical order from London by Martin Jakes, former senior fellow at the Department of Politics and International Studies at Cambridge University. From Beijing, by Professor Jia Qing Guo, Director of the Institute for Global Cooperation and Understanding at Peking University. From Singapore, by Professor Kishore Mabubani, Distinguished Fellow of Asia Research Institute at the National University of Singapore. From Oslo, Norway, by Professor Erstein Toncho, Professor and Director of the Asia Program of Norwegian Defense University. From Bangkok, by His Excellency Apisit Vechachiva, former Prime Minister of Thailand. And last but not least, from Shenzhen, Southern China, by Professor Zhang Chuanjie, Deputy Director of the Center for U.S.-China Relations at Tsinghua University. The warmest welcome to all of our panelists. We are also very pleased to be joined virtually from different parts of the world by audience members who specialize in political studies, journalism, and business. They include uh, very accomplished uh, scholars as well in international relations, and of course, a lot of young faces. So the warmest welcome, and thank you very much for taking time to be with us today. To kickstart the discussion, let's first take a listen to a keynote message from Mr. Long Yong Tu, who is former Vice Minister and Chief Representative for Trade Negotiations for China's accession to the World Trade Organization. Dear friend, colleagues, it's a great honor for me to participate and uh, speak to this edition of uh, Global Thinkers Forum. As the world is now is constantly shaped and being shaped, hereby confidence is the key word. First, we are confident on the strength of our own country. We believe in a political system which can mobilize all the forces to achieve our national rejuvenation. We believe in our economic system, which is based on the continuous economic reform and uh, opening up to the outside world with other developing countries. We share the same history, share the same destiny in the history, we share the same goal in the future, which is to create peace and prosperity for our people. Thirdly, we have confidence on the people from the developed world. We have the good will and uh, patience to convince them that the rise of China as well as other developing countries is not a threat to them, but it's a big opportunity. So we believe that we could have a better communication and understandings with the people from the developed world. As long as we have confidence, as long as we can unite and get together, we will see that the sky will not fall down. I wish 
our forum a great success. Thank you very much. Many thanks to Mr. Long Yong Tu for that very optimistic message. But the writing is on the wall with the COVID-19 pandemic, the climate change crisis, the Russia-Ukraine conflict, and uh, escalating geopolitical tensions, to say the least, between the world's two largest economies. It looked like that the post-World War II order is fraying around the edges. How can China and the United States navigate these troubled waters? And will we lead the world in a constructive or destructive direction? Let's hear from Susan Thornton, former Acting Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs. Hello, I am Susan Thornton, Dong Yunshang in Chinese, and I'm very happy to be here with you at this important forum on global trends and cooperation with CGTN. In the world today, there are many trends and events that are very worrying. First, the pandemic has brought disaster to many, and we are not out of it yet. In addition, though, we also face Russia's war in Ukraine, global economic difficulties, environmental disasters, and deteriorating relations between the world's two most powerful and capable countries. The globally connected world is more in need of stability, rules, and institutions than ever. We need to cooperate and strengthen these systems, but these are being pushed aside as nations jockey for position. U.S.-China relations have never been smooth or easy. My Chinese colleagues always used to say that U.S.-China relations was full of twists and turns. Now each side feels threatened by the other, and I think these fears are exaggerated on both sides. There's poor communication and lack of exchanges during COVID, and these have made things worse. Officials in Washington and Beijing are making a lot of assumptions about one another that may or may not be valid, particularly with regard to so-called timetables for conflict. We need to enhance communication, make clear that we will coexist and co-prosper. The world is watching to see whether the U.S. and China will have the wisdom to act in their own interest or if they will be carried away by posturing and passions and insecurities. Will we lead the world in a constructive or a destructive direction? There's obviously only one right answer to these questions, and I am confident that we will get it right, but it will take a lot more hard work and communication between us than we've seen in recent years. It is very important that our leaders meet in person and articulate a vision for U.S.-China relations that is enduring and that others will respect. That is what I hope we are working on now and what I hope to see in the future. So thank you very much and enjoy the conference. Many thanks to the video message from Susan Thornton. Let me turn directly to our panelists then. Let me start with Martin, because you wrote the book about what you think will happen when China rules the world. And exactly, now that question for, is uh, not clear for many people, right? Because they're not sure what China wants. And there's, as uh, Susan alluded to, even this idea that there is a timetable for conflict that some people are trying to, you know, uh, uh, talk about or raise people's attention to that there is a coming conflict with China. What do you think of this kind of assumptions? I think that in the West, the, re the real problem is that China's rise has been for a long time underplayed, not really understood, um, distorted in all sorts of ways. I mean, you know, China's so different from the West. And so uh, in the West, there's just a fundamental, I think, lack of understanding and therefore suspicion about China. And to overcome this and create a better atmosphere between the two countries is, is I think, is going to be very challenging. Um, I'm not a pessimist, but I am very concerned. I think it is possible to reach some kind of understanding. But, for example, the United States will 
at some point have to accept that China is uh, enjoys parity with it, and that is a big problem for America. And I think that since Trump has been one of the big sort of elephants in the room. Let me get the Chinese perspective from uh, Professor Jia Ching Guo. There, um, actually, this question, the most recent, uh, most recently was asked by an article that was uh, published by the for the magazine Foreign Policy. What does China want? And in the article, the author says China doesn't want to be a superpower, one pull of many in the international system. It wants to be the superpower, the geopolitical sun around which the system evolves. What do you think of this? Well, it depends on what you mean by China. <laughs> China is not one person. Uh, I think there are many Chinese and uh, they have different views. But as far as the Chinese government is concerned, it has been saying that uh, we do not want to be a superpower. Uh, in the eyes of the Chinese uh, uh, mainstream, uh, the superpower stands for uh, bullying others. Uh, the, the country that bullies others. Uh, of course, we don't want to be a superpower. But do China want to be a leader? Uh, that's a different question. Uh, uh, if uh, uh, you, you can be both a superpower and a leader, uh, but the superpower uh, has to be in, uh, taken in a neutral sense. That is, uh, it's the big, uh, it's uh, much stronger than uh, other major powers. Uh, that's the superpower. A leader, uh, of course, every country want, wants to be a leader, uh, and, and in, in theory can be a leader uh, in terms of coming up with uh, advanced ideas, uh, foresight, and uh, wisdom. So uh, I think what China wants to do, uh, I think a lot of people in China uh, would prefer this, that is uh, to be an enlightened <laughs> leader uh, uh, and uh, working with other countries uh, uh, and for, for peace and prosperity. Let me get back to you maybe in a, in a while, but I want to get our um, friend from Thailand, Mr. Apisit Vechachiva. I want to get to your take because you are very much familiar with China and you see China's position in a very different way than many foreigners. How do you see the goals, the objectives that, has been, that have been articulated by the Chinese leadership, for instance, building itself into a strong socialist country by the middle of the century. And why do you think there is such a gap between China's articulated goals, future for itself, and the perception in the minds of many in the West? From my point of view, I think for, for China, I think she has proven herself to become a very significant and growing force and probably will become the biggest force economically. And I think that demands the kind of uh, respect, if you like, as well as a recognition of the role it has to play in global politics as well. And, and, and to do that, uh, we need to overcome uh, what many panelists have already mentioned in terms of suspicion and distrust. And for me, I think as our problems uh, have, as, as I've said, have become globalized, we need cooperation, we need coordination, and we need a strong multilateral system. And the way to move forward, I'm afraid, cannot be left to either the United States or China, but it needs a global effort. Basically, we need the international organizations and institutions to reform themselves, to reflect the changing balance of power, we need um, international groupings, organizations, regional uh, cooperations, um, not to turn into protectionist blocks, but be open and provide platforms and forums in which both the US and China can have a, a much more relaxed dialogue than when they talk to each other. And we, above all, I think we need to re rebuild trust as quickly as possible. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Apisit uh, Vechachiva. We'll get back to what to do, but uh, Kishore, let me hand this question really important, really short to you. What does China want? Well, I think China clearly wants to have 
China be respected again as one of the most successful civilizations on planet Earth. And clearly, this is a very natural desire on the part of China. And as China is coming back, there is no necessary for a zero-sum game. China's civilization can live with a successful uh, Western civilization with a successful United States. But that's the theory. Sadly, in practice, I can tell you that let's be very realistic. The next 10 years will be very difficult. Because what China wants, which is something quite reasonable to succeed and become the most successful economy in the world, is seen as a threat by the United States. So therefore, in theory, we can have a world where a successful Chinese civilization lives with the rest of the world. In practice, let's get ready. Let's fasten our seat belts and get ready for 10 years of a massive geopolitical contest. Wow, that's, that's sombering. I <laughs> I will get back to you in just a moment, but let me get our perspective uh, from our uh, European perspective. Uh, Professor Tongshi, um, from Europe, I know it's a very different perspective. A lot of people will probably think very differently as to exactly what China wants, especially after the war broke out in Ukraine. Tell us what you understand is China's objective. Well, first of all, thank you for, for having me in this excellent forum. Um, in my views, I think uh, China, as Kishore has pointed to, China wants to reestablish its position as the dominating power in its region. And that is understandable. Uh, but at the same time, it is understandable that the United States will seek to prevent it. So uh, picking up on Professor Jia's point, I, whether the Chinese government official policy is that China is not a superpower, it doesn't really matter because the United States and China are the two most powerful states in the world today. They are much more powerful than any other states. Uh, and that means that we have two superpowers. And that's why we have a discussion whether we are entering a new Cold War. I don't think we are entering a new Cold War. I think the new superpower rivalry in the 21st century will be very different from the 20, 20th century. Uh, and one of the main reasons for that is geopolitics. But there are differences, of course, in economic interdependence when it comes to ideology, when, it's, when it comes to technological development, mm -hmm. when it comes to institutions. But the really, really most important thing is the fact that China and the United States are confronting each other in a maritime domain at sea mm -hmm. and not on land, which creates a very different arms racing, stability, and, and the role of third-party countries. All right. Professor Zhang, let me get to you. Yeah, a, a lot of points have been made. For instance, China is, is perceived to be seeking dominance, at least in the region, and that China is already becoming the other polar in the world than the United States. What are you understanding? I don't see any um, you know, signs that uh, China is uh, on a way to some uh, hegemony. Uh, I agree with Professor Jia. If superpower means bullying other countries or some some like uh, uh, some forms of uh, hegemony, then definitely China is not seeking uh, this path. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Martin. Let me, I? Yeah, Martin. Let, I know you are Martin, very eager yes. to please. Please go ahead. Uh, well, I think that um, in a way uh, we're underestimating uh, what's happening. I mean, you know, the rise and fall of powers is hardly a new thing. But China is so different from uh, the nations, Western nation states, uh, the US, Britain, France, Germany, that have dominated uh, hitherto, that there is an extraordinary uh, kind of inability to understand what China is all about, because the language of international relations, the concepts of uh, international relations, the realist ideas and so on, have been Western ideas forged in Western relationships. And China is something profoundly different. What it is, is a it? civilization, civilization rather than a nation state. And so China's um, 
China's way of seeing things is rather different. I, that's why I think uh, uh, the idea that it's a threat in the way that, say, the Soviet Union was during in the Cold War is, is wrong. Uh, and uh, I don't think China has those kind of uh, ambitions. But I think China wants to expand, you know, its influence in terms of Chinese notions of, you know, about its history, about chronology. These are all important, by the way, uh, different from Western notions of chronology. Um, what social relations uh, are about, what uh, how societies are made up. I mean, these traditions in China are very different and they don't just limit themselves to China within, but also they expand with China's rise. So this is very difficult for the West, I think. Very, very difficult because the West does not think in these terms. The West has been brought up thinking that, you know, basically the, the world belongs to the West. And then suddenly there's this huge sort of phenomenon and... The West is totally ill-equipped. This is why, by the way, you know, when the, the, the present stage happened with Trump and so on, the language that's dominated the Western response to China is the language of the old Cold War, the language of the relationship with the Soviet Union. Right. In other words, an inability to comprehend China. All right, let me get some response from our Western friends who are on the panel <laughs> or from the other guests on the panel, whether you think that uh, Martin was correct in the way that he tried to look for the answer of the, of the problem or, or the, the, yeah, the root of the problem. Who would like to volunteer there? Uh, Kishore, I, I see you thinking profoundly. <laughs> Do you agree <laughs> or not? Well, I... You know, I, I, I would say that I agree with Martin. See, the, the, the fundamental problem in the world can be explained very, very simply. We've had 200 years of Western domination. But that 200 years of Western domination of world history was an aberration because from the year one to the year 1820 for 1800 out of the last 2,000 years, the two largest economies were those of China and India. So what we are seeing in the 21st century, and I call it the Asian 21st century, why does the head of the uh, yeah. IMF be a, must be a European? Why should the head of the World Bank be an American? Why can't an Asian run the IMF? Why can't an Asian run the World Bank? But you see, this has never happened so far. So you can see, therefore, the world has to make adjustments and I actually believe that the 1945 Western created rules-based order is a gift to the world. If we follow the rules of 1945, we can make space for China, India, and the rest of Asia, and also have a new balance between Asia and the West. You have been watching the Global Thinkers uh, special production on CGTN. We'll take a short break, and when we come back, what will the world look like in 30 years? What will be the role of developing countries, and will there be any changes to the world order? Stay tuned. Facing the unknown is always difficult. In a world in turmoil, it's easy to lose orientation. But when the storms come, we have to see the possibilities. Reinvent. Find new opportunities. Discover a path forward. CGTN. See the difference. Making sense of the overwhelming wave of information means cutting through the noise to shine a light on the heart of the story making room for new perspectives. True understanding means the ability to see events from more than one side. I'm Liu Xin, and this is The Point. What does China want, and what will the world look like in 30 years? According to a recent study, by 2050, the world economy could be twice as large as it is now, with the driving force coming not from advanced economies, but from emerging markets growing twice as fast as they are at present. How will this affect global order? Could the world become more peaceful or more dangerous? And will we be prepared to face the potential challenges and conflicts? 
Welcome to the second part of the Global Thinkers Special jointly brought to you by CGTN and the Institute for Global Cooperation and Understanding at Peking University. From Beijing, I'm Lu Xin. I'm pleased to be joined for this part of the discussion in alphabetical order from Cairo, Egypt by His Excellency Nabil Fami, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Egypt. From Singapore, by His Excellency Professor Kishoma Bulbani, Distinguished Fellow of Asia Research Institute at the National University of Singapore. From Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan, by His Excellency Juma Otobayev, former Prime Minister of Kyrgyzstan and Visiting Fellow at the Institute for Global Cooperation and Understanding at Peking University. And from Shenzhen, Southern China, by Professor Jiang Chuanjie, Deputy Director of the Center for China U.S for U.S.-China relations at Tsinghua University. The warmest welcome to all of you gentlemen. Meanwhile, we are virtually joined by a group of audience from different parts of the world. They are experts, scholars, and of course, students as well of political studies, journalism, and business, and et cetera. Welcome to all of you as well. We have been talking about what China's goals, China's, perspective, China's objectives for itself, but, uh, also, the perception of China in the eyes of people in different parts of the world, the picture is very mixed. I want to go to Professor Zhang first to help us understand sure. a Chinese concept, because Chinese President Xi Jinping has for many times highlighted the idea of building community with a shared future for mankind. And it was included in the constitution of the Communist Party of China. Exactly. What does that mean, you know, for, country, for peoples in other parts of the world in language that they can understand? Yes, uh, I think uh, the, um, you know, the most important uh, meaning of this term is, you know, in, in a globalized age, we are facing um, global problems and then all these problems need glo global solutions. So. That is the that actually underlies the importance of uh, multilateral collaboration cooperation. Um, I think we we actually this uh, this term was brought up even before the COVID nineteen, and the COVID nineteen is the very exact case that shows that you know we have these uh, global problems that um, countries alone cannot solve. So uh, we have to. Uh, you know, strengthen international collabor collaboration to tackle these problems, and, and also climate change too. So you can you have a long list of all these uh, global problems, and in the past, you know, uh, uh, countries uh, usually you know do this unilaterally or bilaterally. But then we have to realize that all these are uh, problems or issues, challenges that are faced by humanity as a whole. So uh, I guess that's uh, that's one of the uh, very important uh, contents of the of the concept. Uh, uh, yes, back to you. Yeah, very interesting, um, Mr. Otobayev. Let me go to you because from Central Asia we are connected. We are close neighbors, and yet um, the understanding. Um, both ways have not been sufficient, I must say, and yet efforts have been made. For instance, uh, this year will mark the 30th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic ties between China and Kyrgyzstan. All kinds of activities are being undertaken. And during a visit to Central Asia by Chinese State Councilor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi at the end of July, he said that China and Kyrgyzstan agreed to build a China-Kyrgyzstan community with a shared future. How do you understand this proposal and where does that fit in to the Kyrgyz understanding of what China wants? Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, uh, let me say a few things divided into two groups. First is kind of global uh, vision and second, uh, second is the regional one. So the globally we observing now the retreat of globalization. <clears throat> The war in Ukraine, the energy crisis, the tension around Taiwan, changing the world. So, in this particular situation, we need urgently to see some kind of leadership. And honestly and realistically, it's only two countries, which are both in Asia, China, and India, can take the leadership. Shanghai Cooperation Organization might take leadership 
in reshaping the world. And number two is regional uh, aspect. And in that respect, since we are bordering China and we for centuries we were close to each other, we expect China to be even more active in Central Asia. Surprisingly, China is currently having only 5.5% of total foreign direct investments in Central Asia. All conspiracy theories saying that China is fighting with Russia on dominance in Central Asia, but it isn't. Yes, China is a big lender to the Central Asian countries, but not the biggest, only number fourth among bigger places, bigger countries in Central Asia. So we expect more China in Central Asia, more foreign direct investments, and especially cooperation in high-tech industries, because Central Asia countries are very high educated population, and we expect not only construction or whatever gas or oil pipelines which are linking us, but also working on high technology. Why don't to create in China Silicon Valley where people all over the Asia will come and make discoveries and inventions? This is what we are continuously saying to our Chinese counterparts. Let's take leadership in high tech and then we will see the future. All right. Mr. Fami, let me get to you, uh, the perspective from you personally, of course, but also helping us understand the perception of what China wants to achieve, its objectives, its interests, especially looking ahead in the next 20 to 30 years. What is your understanding? Well, clearly China wants to play an increasing role. Uh, its priority is economic, but with, pri with economic issues, you ultimately also play the political and security uh, role as well to at least safeguard your own investments. But I'd like to actually throw out another proposal. I think the world order is frankly not relevant to the present situation in the world. And I think developing countries with the support of China need to look at a rebalancing of the world order. There will always be major countries and medium sized and smaller countries, but we cannot continue to uh, manage things on the basis of a balance of power and spheres of influence of the post-World War II uh, victors. It's time to go towards a collective balance of interest and to understand the collective common good. Uh, the quote that you gave at the beginning is an indication of the importance of a shared uh, world community, and it's something that developing countries need to engage in. It's not too late, it's never too late, the opportunity today is there, and uh, we need to speak out on how to look towards the future. Two other quick things, which involve China as well. Uh, developing countries, their economies are growing significantly, but I would add that I'm, I'm a physics math major, and therefore I like numbers, but don't respect them out of context. Uh, I'm not worried about how quickly we grow in respect to ourselves. I am more, more interested in how quickly we grow in respect to others. Uh, therefore, I'd like to see the developing countries having a greater share, a uh, higher value added share in the production line. I don't want to be the resource for the lowest component or the raw material. Uh, but no, I want to be a more higher value in the uh, uh, chain of, of production. And I think, frankly, China can help us significantly in doing that. My last comment is uh, developing countries need to take on their own regional conflicts in a more aggressive, constructively aggressive fashion, rather than allowing them to be the priorities of the major powers Kishore, I really wanted to ask you something because you sounded very, very sure of the benign nature of the future of China or the future country China wants to be. And I think that's the problem because a lot of people do not believe in that. They believe that because of the evil nature of 
the Chinese regime. They believe that when China becomes more developed through projects such as the Belt and Road Initiative, it's going to do bad things. And that's why it is not in the interest of the West, including the United States, to allow China to get stronger <clears throat> get more influential through projects such as the BRI initiative. How do you answer that question? Well, I think it's very important. Whenever I speak to an American audience, I, actually I gave a Harvard lecture uh, that's been viewed over a million times on YouTube now, I think. And the key point I make is that China is one of the oldest civilizations. I think I think here, Egypt, of course, is also one of the oldest civilizations. <laughs> uh, we must remember that too. And, 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 and therefore, all civilizations have their own vision, their own wisdom uh, that is also uh, guiding them. And in the case of China, then, I mean, of course, historians will dispute this enormously. The, the record shows that China overall, if you look at its longer history, over 2,000, 3,000 years, has not been militarily aggressive. I mean, if China was militarily aggressive, Australia today would be populated by Chinese and not by British descendants. No, Australia is so much closer to China and so far away from the United Kingdom but it was the British that colonized Australia and not, 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 not the Chinese. Of course, Chinese power is a reality. We have to deal with it. But it, 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 is, it is also in China's interest, and this is very, very critical. If China can succeed peacefully, why go to war, right? And so the rest of the world can cooperate with China and encourage China and work with China to succeed peacefully because a peaceful China's rise is what the world wants. But this is where the United States, unfortunately, I mean, I say this is a friend of the United States, you know. Yeah. You know, see this as a zero sum game and that's where the problem is. Yeah. But we got to persuade, this is why I, I want to repeat what I said earlier. Mm. The 140 countries that signed the Belt and Road Initiative should also explain to Washington, D.C. that they want to work with the United States and they want to work with China and they want to see peace between the United States and China. Um, Mr. Fami, let me go to you because you come from one of the oldest <laughs> in civilizations <laughs> and I, I'm sure you must have uh, something to share with us. How do Egyptians look at the re-emergence of China as one of the leading uh, polities or economies or countries in the world. How do you look at China's rise? Is it an it's opportunity? A great question. Yes. Uh, when I was when I became foreign minister, I sent a letter to the foreign ministers of China, Russia, and the U.S. that I wanted to visit. And of course, we had very close relations with the U.S. When I went there, they mentioned, "Why are you going to visit Russia and China?" And I said, "Because it serves Egypt's interest." It's not to replace you as America, but it's to serve me. I need to engage friendly countries around the world. When I came to China, and I still have good relations with my Chinese colleagues, what I, I came here, open mind, open heart, wanting to engage, but as you said, we're 7,000 years old, so we're not naive. Uh, clearly, there has to be a mutual benefit in this process, but what Egyptians look towards China without any negative baggage. Uh, so they're receptive to ideas coming from China, receptive to projects coming from China. They don't have the hiccups that China's success is at their uh, cost. But I have to admit, and this is what I told my Chinese friends, Egyptians don't really understand China either. So I urge my Chinese colleagues, you need to explain more and more what you're looking for, what you'd want to do, what's your political mindset all about, because after 70 years of a bipolar post-World War II world, we're suspicious about big powers. Uh, so I look at China as a wonderful opportunity, uh, which we will engage in to create the new order I was mentioning, because uh, I don't want to be part of a polarized world only. 
But I also look at China as a, a party that needs to engage us, needs to contribute to raise our capacity, but needs to explain itself better in the international community. Uh, time is very limited. We have to go to the Q&A session there. Our members of the audience are getting uh, anxious. Please identify yourself and, and uh, to whom this question is addressed to, please. Yes, a young lady raising her hand. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Nulai Zhu and I, um, I work for a, an NGO called Mexico Water Information Network and we aim to bring clean water and clean high quality water um, to underprivileged uh, communities in China. And here is actually my question. I heard that um, uh, one of our uh, speakers mentioned that, that the China needs to explain itself better. And um, I'm wondering like what else um, have to be done uh, either by China or by um, develop, developing countries or, na or neighboring countries um, to make the U.S. recognize or understand that the developing country the developing countries are not taking side between China and the U.S. and that China is not a nation in favor of war um, and China wants a peaceful rise. Um, so this is my question. Yeah, anybody who would like to answer that question? Mr. Fami, of course. Yes, thank you. It's a, it's a, again, it's a great question. The, the American approach is defined by what they call American exceptionalism. They believe that they are have a wonderful model that people should apply. They also believe that they should be the only, always at the top of that paradigm. Uh, I'm, I'm pro-West, I, I like good relations with America, but I don't believe that anybody has the right to always be the winner. Uh, the Chinese are growing and they are therefore more engaged. Just this last year for the first time, they actually made a proposal about pursuing peace in the Middle East for Middle Easterners which was not the case in the past. As you grow, you have to explain yourself more. Uh, if you don't, then you leave a vacuum for those who want to criticize you, those who want to accuse you of having malicious reasons. While if you do, you generate more support among stakeholders that will stand up and say, well, the Chinese explained it this way and they've supported this concretely in these ways. So, it's not a matter of what more you need to do. If you don't do it, you lose the PR uh, larger debate while others are more focused on doing this. So I think you should do it because you don't explain yourself enough. You have a very sophisticated, deep uh, culture and history, but also because others are always pointing towards you as being the next, I don't want to use the word enemy, but the next challenge yeah. out there. And you need to respond to that. Absolutely. Many thanks to our excellent panelists and uh, all the appreciations for my members of the audience for having stayed with us for this very important discussion. Thank you so much for joining us from different parts of the world. With that, we come to the end of the Global Thinkers special jointly brought to you by CGTN and the Institute for Global Cooperation and Understanding at Peking University. On behalf of the team, thanks for watching. And you've got the point.